And that learning, that intentional decision, that pivot, that shift literally breaks the cycle of dysfunction. And and you talk about patterns of dysfunction. Can you unpack what role understanding reoccurring cycles of dysfunction, what role does it play in your journey as well as the book? So when I first started writing the book, um, it took me a while because it was something that I had to live through, that I had to understand. And I can't tell you that I have fully understood the whole revelation of it, but I have come to an understanding where I can say, hmm, that happened that way for a reason. And now let me move past it and help somebody else not make the same mistake. So when I started the book, it started on how we look at the people that we are trying to date. Because as an educator and as a ministry leader, I have seen brokenness in all forms. And I have compared the brokenness that I've seen to my own. Even though I have been in church, I wasn't raised in the church by my parents. God called me by name. And so even from that, I can see his hand on me. So I start with fatal attraction. Mm. Who are we choosing? Because I believe that the number one thing that Satan uses to break us down is sex, mm. identity, mm-hmm. relationship. Mm-hmm. If I can if I can push you to choose the wrong person, I can break everything about you. And so mm-hmm. when we take the scales off our eyes and we say, I'm not choosing for a good time, I'm choosing because this is my destiny and this is my legacy. And I need God in, in the midst of it, then our, our our mind, you know, you allow yourself to choose God's best rather than just somebody that you're, you, you know, for a temporary situation. And so that's kind of how I start the book with how the legacy is first broken and it's broken with how we choose. Mm-hmm. Because um, I heard Darius Daniels, I was listening to some this morning and he said, you know, you will. You're born looking like your parents, but you will die looking like your decisions. Yes. Right. And so, it, you know, now, granted, I'm not beating anybody over the head over decisions because we're all still learning in this good book. Help us. But be like, Lord, can you please walk it through for me? OK, can you walk me by the hand? But um, it's some stuff that we cause on ourselves. And until we acknowledge that, we won't be set free. Mm-hmm. I can't mm-hmm. blame anybody else for my brokenness. But I can say Joe Copeland, stand up. You weak in the knees. Yes. Okay, let's, let's, let's get it together, right? Let's get it together. You know, it can and, be a, and, and, it can be a really it, scary it thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it can be mm-hmm. a really scary thing to ask God, please show me me because I want more of you and everything that you want from me. And, but that does, that really requires you to look ha- allow yourself to be open and vulnerable enough to say, Lord, show me me. I want, I want to understand where I'm making poor decisions, where mm-hmm. I have unhealthy relationships, where toxicity continues to cycle in my life. And you share very personal and very vulnerable parts of your story in the book. What was the process like for you to share so much of your story? And just as you said, you lived it. So Mm -hmm. what was that journey of getting it out of yourself and on to paper? What was that like? It was the first motive was, I'm, to be quite honest, Mm -hmm. because of the call that God has had on my life. Now, let me take you back. My Mm -hmm. mom and dad never went to church. My mom and dad weren't even married, but my dad was always present. Okay. I'm the youngest of six. My mom passed away when I was 13 years old. During the time that she was alive, Mind you, she never went to church. It was people that knocked on the door and asked us in our neighborhood if we wanted to go to church. I just always had the desire to do it. With that, it comes persecution because now you're not doing things the same way everybody else in your environment is doing things. And you are being isolated, persecuted. 
because of wanting to do the right thing. You think you all that. Um, you will never amount to anything. Uh, just because you got this, I mean, and all you're trying to do is do the right thing. So after being hurt so many times from the people that I love, I was trying to figure out why do people hurt people so much? Mm -hmm. And I came to one conclusion. It's brokenness. Mm -hmm. They're broken in different areas of their life and they're projecting it on me. And at times I have projected it on other people. So I want to make sure that when I wrote this book, it wasn't a slender book. It was a, got a revelation of who I was and what I have gone through. And my heart was to say, God, let me help heal your people. Because if our people are healed, then I can quit being attacked. <laughs> if our people are healed, then I don't have church hurt. Like, I just want us to heal so we can be the best version of ourselves. But we can't do that until we acknowledge where we were or where we are. And I had to go all the way back to childhood. When did it start for me? How did it start? What has happened in my own family that has caused me to feel like I have to protect myself or I feel like I'm, I'm not I'm the black sheep? I had to figure out that but also be strong enough in who God has called me to be, to not be afraid to share it, despite the consequences. Because when you've gone through enough, what else can you do? Like my niece said one time, you can't fall off the floor. All <laughs> things you can do is get up. <laughs> so, but there to lose at this point, yeah. right? You get persecuted when you are a Christian, you get persecuted when you're not one. You get persecuted if you're successful and you get persecuted if you're not. So somewhere in the middle, we got to find a common ground to say, hey, OK, let me figure this thing out. Because what I don't want to do is project my brokenness to my children. And that's where the legacy comes. I don't I don't want them to go through what I've gone through. You know, I want to be. And now I can't stop the hand of God of doing what he needs to do. But what I can do is be a, a, a supporting person for my kids so if they have those questions i have enough wisdom to direct them in the right way because i didn't have that i didn't have these conversations i had to figure it out so that's kind of i can't even remember yeah. what the question was but that's no, kind of no. I so, <laughs> so you took us back to the context of recognizing mm -hmm. that this really required you to step back and say you know what I need to understand this pattern of brokenness. Like it's coming, I'm getting beat up. And even that first shift of this actually isn't about me. This is like that heart hurtful interaction isn't about me. This is the mm -hmm. pain that that person has not processed, has not healed from. Mm -hmm. And now they're deflecting it onto me. And I now have to choose, am I going to receive it, hold mm -hmm. on to it, allow it to go into me, or am I going to recognize, hold it back out so that God can have access to it and I stay clearly on my path of healing? Mm 